Well, hello. Since you last saw me, which was four hours ago, well, when I recorded the last video, my hair was longer, and now it's shorter. And that's about all that's changed. So today, we are going to attempt to hard mill the backside of the blade that I have on the machine. Now, in the last video, if you watched it, the update video, I talked about uh, how I'm hard milling the proper way now and what I mean by that is before what I was doing was let me get you down here so you can see my hand movements very important um, what I was talking about before was the blade would sit there on the plate and you would cut it no seriously um, I was using cutters and coolant to hard mill and it would take mm, like two hours and 40 minutes just to rough that uh, profile out this rough profile it would take two hours and 40 minutes just to get, not the smooth part, but basically rough out like it enough to where we come by with like a parallel operation and, and clean it up. So I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm doing something wrong because I'm almost certain no one in their right mind would have decided that this was an appropriate use of their time to um, cut that slow. So after doing some research, and there isn't a lot of info about hard milling because it is a tool and die type skill. So obviously, the tool and die industry is all about making uh, molds and things. And I'm gonna, I don't work in the tool and die industry, so I'm gonna go way up base here. But um, you basically make molds that can be pressed in presses, blah, blah, blah. And the molds had to be really, really strong. So they usually made it like D2, hardened D2, or like S7 tool steel. It could be like a press break type uh, shear or whatever. So it's all hard steel, and they are the masters at machining this hard steel in its hardened state because um, there's no post-processing, all that. So that's what hard milling is. Um, that is quite the rant. So <clears throat> what I was doing before was going really slow, and because the calculator I'm using, FS Wizard, which is an app on my phone, it was telling me that I had to go as slow as I was going because of it being as hard as it was. Hard milling, if you use the correct tools, you can actually go significantly faster. So I was using the correct coding of tools, so Alton. Alton looks like this. It's this color coded. It's this dark black. There's also, um, this is how it's spelled. Alton, which is, uh, I don't know what the chemical composition is, but I'm gonna guess there's aluminum in it because it starts with L. Um, there's also uh, another one, which is uh, Ty Allen. That's another coating. And those coatings are for hard milling, and they're activated, at least from my research, they're activated by heat. And if you spray the cutter with cold coolant, and naturally it is colder than the cutting edge, it causes the carbide to actually fracture. And the coating doesn't do anything because the coating is activated by heat. Um, so what I started doing was I started using air, and so air blasting the tool and basically going a lot faster, and the results blew me away. Um, well, they actually did. I was really excited. So I went from basically, I do like a semi-finish, so you rough out, you get these stair steps, right? Well, if you, f if you go straight from the adaptive into the finished tool path, the tool has to deal with these inconsistent stair steps, which is causes weird chip loads on the tool, causing weird surface finishes and naturally killing the life of the tool. So which, what, I, what I understand you do, and I'm doing this in practice, is you adaptive rough the part out because um, hard milling is really good with adaptive tool paths. You rough it out, and then what you do is you do a semi-finish, which means you leave a little bit of stock, and in this case, I'm leaving five thousandths, and I don't know if that's enough yet, so I'm still learning. So right now I'm leaving, leaving five thou on the semi-finish. So the semi-finish is just a parallel operation. So what we're doing is you have the part, you do your adaptive, which is the swirly bits, and then you have stair steps, which is quite natural. The parallel comes in, and it'll actually smooth out the stair steps to a consistent, um, consistent step, if you will. Then when you come in with the final tool path, and what I'm using for that is the steep and shallow, which in reality, the tool, the part is so um, um, shallow that you could just use a parallel operation. But the steep and shallow then comes in, and it doesn't have to deal with those weird stair steps, irregular, not normal 
um, bits of material left. Um, so like I said, you adaptive, you do a semi-finish, still leaving stock, and then you come in and do your final finish. And you have to leave stock on your semi-finish because if you come in and you leave like only one or two thou, the tool might not actually peel a chip and instead it'll start to rub your, your part and it'll actually um, cause a rather garbage surface finish. So yeah, that's kind of my thought process currently. And what we need to accomplish today is I have the front blade done. Like it's roughed out, there's still tabs on it, but it's roughed out, it's, semi it's finished and it's to shape, but the tabs are still on it. So what I do is I take the this shape and I flip it over so it, it sits like this in our fixture. And then we'll come in and basically do the same exact operation set on the back side, and then we cut the tabs off with, and the parts clamped and everything. Um, my The issue I've been running into is the fact that when you flip it over and you come into this this type fixture that I'll show you guys um, I have the part doesn't line up necessarily like the the bevel of the blade is different on one side to the other side noticeably and the problem is if they don't match it's completely a throwaway and it's unsellable and really the problem with the hard milling is there's a lot of steps involved just to get to this part like the um, roughing out and the heating and everything um, so we're going to work on the new fixture because I have a couple changes to the blade. We're basically just going to cut a negative image of the this part. It is then going to rest in there, and I've already said all that, so why don't we just get into it, and I can stop rambling like a crackhead. Okay, so this is off to for the fixture, as I was talking about. So we're going to take this, put it in this shape, and do our fancy milling. Now the problem I've been having is... Maybe the blade doesn't necessarily fit in here perfect, and I've made a couple changes, so we have to mill it anyways. I've had to, the tabs that are left on here are actually taller than this top surface because I don't have a surface grinder, so what I decided to do was hard mill the top surface and make that as parallel to the machine as possible because I don't have a surface grinder. If I did, the tabs would be the same height and everything would be good. The tabs being taller than this top surface means we need to cut a pocket deeper on this for the tabs so they sit flush at the bottom. Uh, pretty simple. So what we're going to do is basically just going to readapt this part out. Might not cut anything. It's aluminum though, so I'm not too worried. And then we're going to cut contour those tabs out and uh, then adapt it clear and dig those holes out. Uh, I also, I need to check this with a tenth indicator and make sure it is in fact still uh, parallel to the y-axis because I had a blend issue that I think was caused by this fixture maybe not sitting straight. So let's check that first and then we'll go into the actual toolpath uh, work and cut it out. Yeah, that's not that great. Four tenths over only a distance of like three inches. So I'm gonna sweep the entire block and see what it says. Okay, so half a thou over the entire distance, that's actually not that bad. It must be our fixture block that is a little off, so. Uh, yeah. So what we'll do is we'll probe in the square on the outside, we'll do all four sides, and then we will machine it from that, and hopefully that'll kind of <clears throat> get our, our, uh, you know, our angle right. But not necessarily because, well anyways, we'll just try it. So it's actually good that our thing was still straight, but obviously just the little fixture block itself is a little off. So that's okay, we'll just probe it in and we'll cut to wherever it's probed and that'll hopefully um, set our things straight. And uh, yeah, let's try it. We're gonna probe this guy in, took this back fixture off, probe the fixture in with our probe. And then we will cut the pockets. So we're gonna adapt them out. Contour and then contour all that stuff. Alright, we got her probed in. 
So we're going to go in with our radius tool and tear some aluminum up or something. Check out what just came in the mail. That's right, 20 CV. Did you know that M390 and 20 CV are practically the same metal? But 20 CV is made by Crucible, I think, and M390 is made by um, European words, like bowl or something. I think they're German. I actually have no idea. Could be Japanese. You know, somewhere over there. Well, yeah. So, 20 CV is a super, super good steel. Like, very, 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 very good steel. Like, one of the best you can get, kind of. Um, so, that's why I'm using it. I was using S45VN the last time. That's also a really good steel, but 20 CV and M390 or a tier above S45 PM. By the charts. Now, the heat tree and the blade geometry kind of determine really uh, edge retention and uh, blade toughness. Uh, but on a chemical scale, if you will, a mechanical scale, 20 CV is better than S45 PM. So, yeah, that's why I'm using it. It's also significantly more expensive, so that's got to mean something, right? Good times. Okay, so technically speaking, now if we take this, flip it over and put it in here, it should fit. But there's this thing um, called tool deflection, and I have a splinter in my finger and it really hurts. Um, the issue is when we take this off, I cannot locate it back to the fixture to cut it. And if it doesn't fit in here, what that means is we have to cut the contour of this wider. But that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the wrong size, it could mean that this is the incorrect size. So, yeah. Um, what I could do is actually measure this with Fusion's, uh, what's it called? Basically, verification thing. Um, I think I'm actually going to try that and see if that actually works. Might be interesting. Okay, here is our part. It is sitting on the fixture as it's uh, shown. What the heck is that? Alright, whatever. Um, these points, the probe's going to actually probe these points, and it's going to print out a dprint file, which is going to go into the control in this probe results file. We will then take that dprint file, import it back into Fusion, and it'll actually tell us how far off our stuff is based on the selected points. And I've used this once before, and it works, it seems to work pretty good, but, um, you know, we're in the physical realm here, so sometimes things don't fit anyways, but we'll give this a shot and see if it actually uh, checks out. So what it's going to do is pull the probe up, and it's actually going to walk around the part and basically take measurements based on where we selected. So I like to go nice and slow and just make sure we're not going to blow the probe up. Cool, that's a good sign. So I measured a pocket. It's actually really cool. And you guys can't see, there you go. Even got bevel measuring, so I have it set on points on the actual bevel. So that'll tell us if our uh, cut was right. And it it goes to the points in the order you select them, so just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, so what you do is, whoops, you go into the probe tab, 
and uh, you select. I should probably have this in picture, but basically you go to here, actions, import, inspection results. It's going to ask you what you're actually wanting to inspect. You're going to say select, open from my computer, and my OS is on the network, so we're going to pull the file out of the probe results. There's that deep print we just made. Hit open and then it'll give us a bunch of cool green dots. I always get this weird error. Say OK. And then it should be down. You yeah, to pull a results file. So then you can right click and you can do show results. And then it'll give you this really cool chart which took me a couple seconds to understand. But it's basically giving you deviations from the model. So if you look, this one's a 3.7 deviation. So 3 point, or 3, 3 thou, 7 tenths deviation. I just don't like the color scheme they use. But let's check which point that is. Oops, should just drop my headphones. Okay, so that is this point on the back here. And like, that's quite a bit of a deviation, if you will. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the worst one. There's a... Yeah, that is the worst one. And then there's this one, which is a 285. Then there is this one, which is a 242. So what I'm seeing here is... Oh, you guys aren't seeing anything. What I'm seeing here is... The worst deviated ones are the ones that are outside on the contour of the model. So I think armed with that knowledge, we are going to rerun a contour toolpath that basically uh, recuts the outside and see if we can get better results. So yeah. So the toolpath I'm going to use for this is a tool 9, which is a 6 flute, 1 8 cutter. And uh, I'm going to go a little bit slower than I cut it originally. I know you can't see, but I hit it at 12 inches a minute. And uh, we have it, make sure you got wear on. That way you can compensate in the controller. So we'll say OK. And I'm actually going to come over here. And we're going to go to tool 9, which is the tool I just mentioned. See, there's already a wear offset in here. I'm going to say minus 1 thou. I don't want to do the full worst value we had, which is 3 thou, or 3 thou and 7 tenths, because uh, there could be other reasons besides just this wear offset category that's causing it. So don't overstep things when you don't need to. Walk it in. Now, I will say you could argue that the fact that because the piece is so hard, you only stepping in one thou might be too low of a chip load and cause the tool to just rub. And I say, yes, you're correct. And I have no other way to do this except the way I'm doing it. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, do this. Uh, something new that's kind of really important is the when it's probing your part, your work offset your work coordinate system that you used shouldn't have changed. If you get what I'm saying. So there is tool nine, which is using air, I think. I noticed it didn't cut on the front bevel. I thought that was kind of interesting. It didn't actually take a cut up here. Okay, we're gonna re-reprobe it and see if the results are different. 
Okay, so I posted it, we just ran it again, and I'm curious to see what the results are. Right, so the deviations are significantly better. There is a tooth thou one. Tooth thou is, oh, back on the shoulder again. Huh, interesting. That's the worst one, though, is that shoulder. So it looks like we cut it, and like I said, the worst, there's no more um, on the back edge that are bad. Like, in fact, if you look, that one gives us a deviation of only three tenths, which is uh, very interesting. But that's a good sign. This one is only another three tenths, four tenths. Um, but this one is two thou. So we, or I think, maybe the toolpath is incorrect and completely ignoring this part or something to do with the corner that's after it. So if we look at the toolpath, tool nine, it might have something to do with the fact that, let's see if we can pull those and yeah, we'll look at them. Um, I think I can leave them up while they're, okay, very cool. So the tool comes around into this corner, and it might be because of this radius right here that is causing the issue. The good news is this part of the blade itself is not needed for anything. Uh, down here is important because the lock bar insert actually rides up against the surface. But right here, there's nothing. It's just uh, airspace, obviously, and uh, then the pin the uh, lock bar, I mean the uh, back pin, whatever you want to call it, the stopper pin hits up against that surface. Um, uh, so yeah, it looks like we that doing that offset and actually recutting the uh, tool actually made the part a lot better in spec. So that gives me a little more confidence when we actually go to flip it and put it in our OptiTube fixture. So why don't we go ahead and do that now? So here is our cut blade. Pretty nice, I gotta say. Oh, fits like a dream. Man, it fell right in there. Perfection. In fact, it might even be a little too much play, but better to have this problem, I guess. So check it out. So it drops in. And uh, the tabs fit. I think the thing we can't see and we won't really know is is the center section of the blade, the flat part, resting on this section. It is super, super imperative, crucial, whatever fancy word you want to use, that it sits flat because what's happening is we're taking the bevel down to such a thin edge that if there's any sort of air gap, the tool will actually bend the bevel down into that gap and ruining or at least making my life very difficult. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. So this is awesome. I'm gonna zip this down. We will uh, continue doing the work and uh, yeah, we'll just kind of walk through the rest of it. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna engrave 20 CV right on the blade. And this will basically tell us if the height is correct. So I have it set to zero, zero, zero octave. Axial, wow, my English is bad today. Zero axial, oh my god, axial, axial offset, okay, axial, axial, axial offset, zero. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna try that, and then if that goes good, then we know that at least the blade is in a very good spot. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do. We're going to, I set the center of the block, but the top surface as our Z, um, our work offset. What this is gonna now do is it's gonna come in and actually probe the circle and, or the uh, board, the reamed surface, if you will, and that'll update the work coordinate system to be like dead nuts, I think. Um, so it, it works, this update work coordinate system in Fusion works, it works okay, um, it works, like pretty good, but I always like to do this. What I'll do is I'll come into our offset page. We're using G50, G154P1, which is offset number seven in Fusion. 
and it's annoying that it, they don't match, but here is our current setup, negative 22, 6, 1, blah, 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 across. What I like to do is compare the before and after the probe updates uh, and just see how much, how far off it is. So why don't we do that now? We're going to go ahead and do this. Make sure we're actually selected on the right thing. Position, cool, and watch it. Nice and slow. Cool, that probably won't crash. We only have less than an inch to go. And we'll go into our offsets and look. So it is that P1 you're looking at. I actually didn't notice a change, but it, I was staring at the x-axis, so maybe. You guys might have seen something. <laughs> you have the power of rewinding and I don't. So here's the engraver, and uh, hopefully that goes good. I don't think the engraver was supposed to drill a hole. Oh boy. So, something really interesting. If you don't change the actual offset you're working in to 7, it'll do weird things like that. I think I stopped it before I made a turn. But I'm guessing the tip of that engraver is now uh, not so good. But we'll find out. If you were wondering, that's also why it never updated the <laughs> work coordinate system. <laughs> oh boy. Should have probably realized something was not correct. Or I just think the Haas is that accurate. And I do not think it's that accurate. Let's try this again. Okay, yep, I saw a number change. Looks like a tenth on this on this one. Tenth up, I think. And this one changed a little bit, but not much either. So that's uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty close. So let's try our trace operation again. Unfortunately, that hole is permanent, so it looks like this blade has become instantly unsellable. It's okay. It was going to be number one anyways. It'd be, it'd be my baby. Okay, good news. Looks good. Chamfer also lined up. See? See how pretty it is? But now there's a fat hole in our blade, so throw away. Like I was saying, I'm just going to keep it, but good to know that this is somewhat in the correct size. So, yeah. Now we're, what we're going to do is I'm going to clamp this guy right here. Little clamp right here. We're going to remove our bolts, and then we're going to contour our uh, blade here and cut those tabs off. And, uh, yeah. You know, I just had a thought. I think I can fit the end mill around the bolts. And I've had issues where the, the tab will want to pick up and fly off. And if it, the end mill picks the tab up, it'll actually snap the end mill off. Um, so I think I'm going to try to keep the bolts on the tabs and then cut it off. And we'll give that a shot. Okay. All right. We got our tool installed. It's a... Oh, the door. <coughs> it's a uh, 0.015 radius, uh, eighth inch Alton cutter. I should have gotten a stub length, but that's what I got. Regular length. Um, so we're going to clamp this guy. I forgot to put the clamp. It's going to come in ramp and slot cut these tabs off. Now, I will say that I forgot the reason I stopped doing this is because it shipped one of the blades one time. And uh, I'm hoping it doesn't do that this time. That was with S45VN, but I don't learn from my mistakes, so it might do it again. That's okay, because there's a hole in the blade anyways. Blah, blah, blah. Let's give it a shot. This is what it looks like. We're going to contour and do a ramp. And the bolt will be installed, but I don't think it'll hit it. Let it rip, boys.
Hey, great news, guys. It worked really good. Uh, kind of hard to tell. Obviously, the tab's very thin, but no chipping of the edge, which is super awesome. Let me see if we can take this out. So that'll make my life incredibly easy, or easier. Excellent, that gives us full access to this front. So now what we're gonna do is, we can now do a full adaptive, which is awesome with a worrying about hitting the clip. So we're going to adapt it the bevel away and come up here. And then we'll do our parallel, our semi-finish, and then our full finish steep and shallow. And that'll be awesome. Hopefully it matches. Okay, here's what we got. We're going to adaptive. We're going to semi-finish with the parallel I was talking about. Same tool. It's a uh, 3 16 corner radius end mill. And then finally a steep and shallow to finish her off. So let's uh, let's do this. So the cool thing is, like I said before, this coating gets activated with air. So it'll just blow air the entire time and uh, go really fast. Not like really fast, but... Like pretty freaking fast, 21 inches per minute, which seems crazy to me for something at 60 plus Rockwell, but pretty awesome. All right, I will update you guys when it's done. About halfway there, starting to look really good. Alright, that went really good. So that's the adaptive, the stair steps I'm talking about. It'll uh, kind of make the finish a little uneven, so you can see hard milling. You get the nice mirror, pretty sweet. So next is the steep and shallow, I mean the uh, parallel. Clean it up, cut, cut up here too, and then we'll do the steep and shallow to finish it. Alright, uh, sold the desk, so bye bye desk. Had a little interruption, so I didn't film the intermittent part between the uh, the parallel. But here is the final steep and shallow, absolutely beautiful compared to what I had last time. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So the bevel is way, way better than any other time. Oops, I forgot something. See this? Hold on. Okay, it's really hard to tell, but see this line? Oh, there you go. See how it continues and then stops right at the corner? So it's missing just the the edge. So that's something I need to fix really quick. But other than that, we didn't break the edge, which is super awesome. I do need to come in here and just contour just the edge and hopefully that won't chip the blade because it is a little bit. There's a bump right here for me leaving stock to leave when I took the tab off. But yeah, that should be, that should be good. I'm pretty excited because this is the first one like that looks halfway decent off the machine. So yeah, let me contour that edge and then we'll uh, continue on, um, you know, what we're doing. Hey guys, um, sorry for the really disappointing end of this video, but it's the next day, hence my new shirt. I didn't just decide that at you know, 9 p.m. it was a good idea to change shirts. I was just feeling like a white t-shirt would be a little more suited for 9. Um, so it's the next day, which is Friday, and I came in and the aerating pump that I have, the aerating uh, aquatic pump that I have in the CNC coolant tank stopped working. So I pulled it out and there was like bacterial growth on the outside of it. I'll show you. Well, I don't have the growth anymore because I got rid of it. Actually, no weight. There it is. See those yellow things? Why won't you put, there you go. See that, see those, see that? That spore or whatever? Yeah, so um, that was in the tank. Um, so I've had this kind of growth issue for a little while. Like, here's what I think happened. 
Let me step away from the loud equipment. So, in the last winter, end of last winter, so probably April, um, I found out that using water out of the um, dehumidifier, of course that's what it's called, uh, is not a good idea. And the only reason I thought that is because I was like, huh, there's a lot of dirt in this dehumidifier. So I'm almost certain that my bacterial growth started all the way back then from that dirty water. Do not use water out of a dehumidifier. If you have to use water, just use hose water, which is what I've been using, unless you have really hard water, blah, blah, blah. I'm not an expert, but I will say that the hose water is much better than that dirty dehumidifier water, and me getting enough distilled water to keep the tank constantly filled up is uh, really not realistic. Uh, so, anyways, I think that's where the growth came from because I've been fighting this growth for a while, and I finally decided that uh, it was time to drain the tank and, uh, you know, replace the coolant. So I did, and it's Friday, and it was in the morning, so I wanted to switch to Polychem to the... I actually wanted to go to 251C, but nobody had it in stock, and I'm always in a rush for some reason. And I decided that I wouldn't wait till tomorrow <laughs> to get it. I think they had to overnight it, so that would have been really expensive for two five-gallon pails. Um, so I'm running 250C which is just the extreme, it's, I think it's all the same, because um, they had that in stock, and it is cheaper, and the guy, the, the Polycam rep said that 251C is the same as 250, only it has chlorine in it, and supposedly the chlorine works better uh, at heat, for removing heat at the cutting edge for like hardened steels and stuff, which is what I'm doing, but I'm not cutting the hardened steels with coolant, so I figured it would be okay. And he also seemed to think that 250C would work perfect for this application. Uh, another thing that people probably don't think about is the disposal rate for 251C is probably more expensive because of the chlorine. Um, obviously, chlorine's a, it's chlorine, so it's acidic or whatever. I don't know, but I know chlorine is hard on things, so getting disposing, disposing it, having a company to dispose of it is more expensive probably than what's in 250C. Um, so yeah, I wanted to go 251C, wasn't in stock, I'm impatient, so I'm running 250. He said that if you are running 251C, you can fill the tank with 250 and nothing will happen because 251C is 250 with chlorine. Now that also makes me think that you could run 251C in the future by just getting a pail of 251C and slowly adding it and upping the concentration of 251C in the tank. But I didn't ask him that, and uh, maybe don't assume things like that like I do. Um, so yeah, uh, as far as the blades went, the blade went, it went really good. Actually, I'll show you because um, the machine stopped. I'm just, what I'm doing is for the tank, I've, um, I'll just e-stop this. What I'm doing for the tank is I've actually uh, take, cleaned the tank out, uh, dumped in a 50-gallon drum, and uh, filled it back up. Ran. I'm running 2% concentration of the 250C. I didn't have 250C in the tank before. It was Nova Matte 100, so they're different coolants. The 2% concentration with uh, running it, I'm going to run it for 8 hours like this, just full, full-blown coolant. Hopefully, we'll um, get all the cracks and crevices and the pump and everything clean of both the bacteria and the uh, old coolant. Now, um, I'm really crossing my fingers that it gets rid of the bacteria because, um, well, I just am. So, this could could bite me in the next couple of months, but I probably won't find out for an, uh, another couple months. And hopefully by then I'll have a little, little more cash flow and then I can buy like proper uh, skimming and CNC coolant stuff uh, filters. But so yeah, um, filter your coolant and make sure you don't run garbage water. The water is really important. And other than that, oh yeah, I was going to show you the blades. So this is uh, what we've got. I will say that this coolant has a very, very, very strong citrus smell to it. And the other coolant had no smell to it, so it's something I'm really not used to. So I open the doors and get this huge whiff of orange. Um, so it's actually, I put this clamp in and I contour it around and yeah, it's, it's basically done. 
but I'm not going to mess with it until I'm done changing this coolant thing out. I like to think that uh, I get distracted really easy, so I want to like complete one whole task before I move on. And yeah, so this kind of gives me a chance to work on some toolpaths and uh, actually upload this video. So yeah, uh, enough rambling. Um, if you like the video, sub. Follow me on Instagram. I post like daily quite a lot, um, sometimes obsessively. And uh, if you have any questions, please also message me on Instagram because I respond like quite fast. Um, YouTube doesn't really like um, post comments to like push comments to my phone very good. It doesn't really tell me. So that's kind of the thing. And uh, yeah, Instagram's cool. I don't know where you are. are aren't on there unless you don't like facebook which i understand but but anyways the, enough rambling all right catch you guys on the next one